One. A black scarab as big as a Kafka protagonist lay on its back on my staircase. Hooked mandibles clicked, ready to take a pound of flesh and come back for seconds. I could not bring myself to touch it. I could not bring myself to kill it. I stood on the porch, ashamed. Two. It was two in the morning. I was six. I fell asleep with Oliver Twist wanting more and forgot to shut the screen. A thump on the ceiling. I woke to a stag beetle orbiting the light, throwing fearful shadows. Central vacuuming was made for insect night terrors. It was gone in an instant. I never touched it. I never learned its Latin name or what it saw in the light bulb's incandescent halo. Three. We have to be taught to be afraid of insects. It happens around age six, four. On a California Monday, I lurched to a workday shower. Next to the oatmeal soap, a water roach as big as my hand waved from the shower caddy. My feminism spiraled down the drain. <laughs> I screamed like a six-year-old until my husband came to my rescue with a paper sack, which sat on the porch, rustling, for weeks, it eventually starved to death. Five. This newest invader is helpless, tipped on its back on the stairs, legs waving obscure bug semaphore. It couldn't flip itself over, pushing a wing against the ground. It must have gone crazy, gotten sick, wanted to die. Please tell me it wanted to die. Please tell me I didn't let it die because I was afraid. Six. We have to be taught to be afraid of each other. It happens every night at six and eleven, seven. I walked past the black scarab twice before admitting it would go nowhere on its own, would not fly to haunt some other set of stairs. I tipped it over with a cardboard box I pulled from the trash, just barely far enough from fear. It fell down one more step toward the second floor stopped moving at all. Eight. Was I wrong to disturb the order of small monsters? The mercy boot, the oubliette of the vacuum bag. Was it learning some invaluable depth of suffering to bleed out in helpless beauty? Does the scarab understand why it should fear the thousand portraits painted on its compound eye? Nine. Is it wrong to wish we'd been taught rescue instead of fear? Is it wrong I wish I'd held it in my hand? This is called The Sensible Thing to Do. It tracked mud on the white carpet, thorns stuck in its fur, grizzled muzzle gray as your beard. It dropped tribute at your feet in a call for fetch, a gnawed bone raking of earth, grisly with time and tooth mark. Your jaw pulled taut as a bowstring, surveying the disorder of a living room dirty with devotion. Ears flower wilted beneath your shout. It ducked its head, all anguish love betrayed by its own exuberance. Then forgot sorrow under summer sky, head tucked to your knee as you let it pass the house, the savaged garden where it scraped itself a resting spot, the mown field where you once tossed it treasures. You put it down behind the barn for digging at the roots of the rose. This is a poem from my friend Tony Brown back in Worcester and his moving escapades. Uh, a purba is actually a little spiritual dagger. The idea is it's supposed to, you're supposed to cut away the illusions from reality. Um, and this is called American Purba. Moving to a room the size of one free breath, Tony makes as much space as he can for, guita for guitars as he can, discarding a battered office chair that fit his ass perfectly. Mm -hmm. A tar pit bed where he awaited fossilization, his job, his wife. Pairing his collection of knives, he gives me a switchblade for which he has no further use. The blade swings to the sinister side, my writing hand. 
It's a knife I can't open without slicing myself or fumbling with my weaker right. Its bone handle wears to ivory, working end a scratched reflecting pool. I leave it on my desk to dull, fascinated by its swift steel click. It's a pleasure every time I don't use it. There is no such thing as safety. Stable, we hear, is a place where horses sleep. We curate these blades, preserving their disuse, historical reminders of what's cut loose, of what's pinned down, of what's kept whole. How to Cross an Invisible Bridge. The first, most prosaic and practical rule, don't look down. <laughs> the vertigo will be there wherever you stand, tucking at your ripped jeans like an insistent dark-eyed child after candy in the checkout aisle. Don't give in to it. Every time you bite a chocolate bar, it learns to want more of you. The nothing you navigate lies under every shovel full of earth you've piled over it. This fearful journey, a reminder we fall in our season, chosen or inopportune. You'll go, will you or nil you, so go gladly. Why not? Clutching ropes and bindings, your paycheck, your standing, your house, your habit won't steady you here. A tangle of streamers, a ready excuse to put off responsibility. Start at one end. Look to the center, no further. Assume you will be met. Like clapping for Tinkerbell, this chicanery of will pushes your feet towards saving. It'll give you a goal beyond yourself, a bone to distract the sharp-toothed watchdog growling inside the lowest pit of your stomach. In the middle of that bridge, there will be no room to pass one another by, vast panoramas in all directions. The two of you will come to some conclusion about direction. When you choose, you will walk together or apart to one solid side. The last rule, just as commonplace, don't look back. This is uh, called the mother of all sorrows. Standing in the shards of Babel, a statue known as the Mother of All Sorrows smiles faintly down at the remains. Fireflies swarm around her head, intermittent storm and spring green. She is the highest point left standing from the time our tongues turn traitorous strangers. Her form is so much simpler and smaller than the guidebook makes it seem, but the eyes follow you home, staring as if it mattered deeply what you said. It creeps everybody out. She doesn't ask you for a dollar or to run away and join the circus. She doesn't know your secrets or offer you an answer. She hasn't seen the savior or the photos in your office. When you ask for nothing, she hands it over, which is much, much harder than it sounds. Mm. explanation to the sky. We all need to explain ourselves. Cheap movie villain, villains, hyperactive chatterboxes, dyslexic sophists, tedium, tedious sitcom stars, to the senseless, to the indifferent, to the hostile, to our beloveds who read lips perfectly through darkness with their fingertips. Whoever knows who's listening, this is all I understand of prayer, explaining aloud to an audience who may or may not be thinking of ham sandwiches. <laughs> God's too big for me, vague, self-important, fingers in his ears until you drop to beg rainbows to hold up their end of the covenant. I could never get God right, failed to worship or conceive distant perfection. There's just sky there. So much sky. Let me explain. I build collapsing towers, these shaking spiral staircases, without hope that they will stand, collapse unimportant before the effort to bridge that distance. Failure is a side effect of effort, like editing. This glance, as close to faith as I can handle, looking over instead of up. Thank you for kind, for honest, 
for gently, for not caring what I was trying to say, for confusion, superficial worry, for distracted, busy, absent, for human, for all frayed kite strings breaking, for all helium blooms caught in tension wires, for all of the hidden stars I will die before seeing. We owe each other nothing, know each other less. You wish I'd just shut up. Beautiful, I say, just as it should be. There's too much sky for me to speak to all at once. I had to start somewhere.